Hi, hello and welcome. I'm Cindy Atherton. I am the science director at the Heising Simons Foundation in California. I'm also a member of the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate, as well as the advisory committee for the Climate Crossroads Initiative. Um, I feel like I have to take a test whether I remember the four pathways so you can check me later on during the session and see if I did. I'm going to start by introducing our panel. We're actually looking at the pathways and talking about those. So I have, and they're in this order, Jerry Cohen, university professor in the departments of civil and environmental engineering and engineering and public policy and president emeritus of Carnegie Mellon University. We have Glenn McDonald, he's the middle live person. Um, he's the distinguished professor and the endowed chair of California and the American West in geography at UCLA. And then we have Raj Pandaya, the vice president of community science at the American Geophysical Union. And then finally doing the Sheldon imitation on the computer screen is Jonathan Patz, the, the Distinguished Achievement Professor and the John P. Holton Chair of Health and the Environment at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's joining us virtually. Thank you, Jonathan. We appreciate that. Um, each of our panelists is gonna offer some opening remarks, so about seven minutes of remarks, and then we'll have a conversation up here. We'll leave time for questions and answers with the audience, um, both in person and online. So we're happy to include the online participants. If you are tuning in virtually, we encourage you to, to submit your questions in the Slido box, uh, which is below the live stream. Um, we actually have staff within the, the facility here that will help us with those questions online. Um, I also wanna interject, I use the pronoun she, her, um, in case we're doing that, I would like to establish that. So as we just heard from Amanda Stout, Climate Crossroads is supporting pathways to action around critical areas of cross-cutting work that are fundamental to our ability to meet the climate crisis. And I think of these as almost braided pathways rather than four separate pathways. So the pathways that we're gonna be discussing are accelerating decarbonization, supporting thriving ecosystems, cultivating climate resilient communities, and addressing the intersections of climate change, human health, and equity. Our panelists will each offer kind of a high level perspective on the major challenges and opportunities in the areas. That's where we'll be begin, and then we'll dig in a little bit deeper with the conversation. There'll be about 20 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So Jerry, I'll start with you. Um, you've been a longtime scholar of civil engineering with a specialty in environmental and water resource systems analysis. You've also been president of a major US university as well as worked uh, with the Academy's board on energy and environmental systems for some time. Can you share with us your perspectives on accelerating decarbonization the scope of the issues to consider, how to leverage engineering as well as societal and policy elements to provide a systems approach to this issue. And can you highlight what you consider the major challenges and opportunities for action in this space in seven minutes? I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll do my best. So I, I am here representing the Academy's Deep Decarbonization Initiative. We are the answer to the question that was asked towards the end of the last session, what could the academies do to accelerate decarbonization? I want you to uh, appreciate what a departure this initiative is for the academies. Uh, I think it's everything you heard the presidents wished we could be doing, and we are doing it because of the president's leadership and support. First of all, it is strategic and proactive not reactive, it's not the usual academy's response to a congressional mandate. It's the academy saying, here's a problem, let's get organized, let's take it on and do something about it. It's sustained. It's not a 18 month, two year, even three year consensus study. This is indefinite for now. 
and intended to go as long as it has to go to help the country achieve what it needs to do to get to net zero by 2050. It represents convergence, what Marsha and Victor and John all talked about, a coming together of all the disciplines that one needs to take on this problem. And I want to emphasize the presidential leadership here. Uh, Victor's still here, and I think John might be around. He said he was going to try to stick around. And Marsha, they really embrace this. And not only do they bring their rhetoric and uh, moral support, they brought money. The president's invested some of their own discretionary money to get this started. That's also a departure. And finally, it's really action-oriented. I sort of said that already, but I want you to appreciate this. Greg showed a slide, a wonderful slide that showed the covers of five reports the academies have done on climate. And the first one on that side said science, and the next one said assessment of science. Uh, and the third one said, hang on, but even Greg doesn't remember. I actually wrote it down. Ah, choices, right. And then it said technology choices. And the last one said accelerating decarbonization and action, a gerund that said we're going to do something. Uh, it, it's a real transformation and a change for the how the academies have approached the problem. So um, what is it actually doing? It's actually done a lot already. And it probably has been around longer than you might expect. Its focus is on policy development uh, in order to achieve the outcomes of achieving uh, net zero by 2050. The focus is on policies at the federal and local level, not just the federal level, and all about decarbonization, where technology is the driver for what um, the effort has, has been doing. The focal point for this organizationally you saw one slide from Greg on the organization of the academies. If he showed you the whole thing, you would have been appalled if you haven't seen it before. It's unbelievably complicated with committees and boards. If you look, if you drill down in the division on engineering, physical sciences, there's a little speck called Board on Energy and Environmental Systems. That's the centroid for this work. I chaired that board for six years until the end of last year. And one of the things we did that was really quite important five years ago was to change the mission of that board. It had been purely engineering and technology focused, but we realized to take on the issue of decarbonization, it had to be more than just technology. We explicitly broadened the mission to take on social, political, and economic dimensions of this problem as well. And this all got kicked off in 2018, five years ago, almost five years ago, with a workshop which led to, to, cons to a consensus study, uh, the first report of which was the one that was highlighted in Greg's slide at the left, um, a second report coming, as you heard, uh, later this year. That first report had recommendations for the federal government, and to a degree to which you might be surprised, it's reflected in the laws that were passed by the federal government uh, within the last two years, the IRA and the others. It really had quite uh, a lot of, of influence. Now, I said that technology and engineering are what's driving our work. But as I already said, uh, we broaden the mission to include uh, non-technical issues as well. Uh, one way to think about this problem is sort of the grand system of systems problem. Um, there's effectively an infinity of pathways one can take. You get from here to net zero in 2050. How do you choose among those pathways? Well, you choose by recognizing there's a problem with multiple objectives. In addition to all the technology issues, we have equity issues, we have community resilience issues, we have public health issues, um, we have work, workforce issues. All of these need to be factored in and have been factored in by the consensus committee that will be issuing its second report of later this year. I said that it's a grand systems problem. 
I think all everybody in this audience can appreciate that. I don't think I have to go into detail about it. But I do want to emphasize the following. So for the decarbonization effort, the way we've been pursuing it, as I said, the focus is on technology, where these other issues are brought in to choose among pathways. But we recognize that the impacts of climate change are many and profound, and that understanding them is crucial, not just because they feed back into choosing our pathways, but because we have to adapt to climate change. We already are starting to, and we're seeing the impacts of climate change. We need to understand um, what climate change means for every one of our systems, um, not just technical systems, but human and environmental systems. And as we heard, the uh, environmental systems themselves are part of the solution as well. There's much more to be said, but I don't want to be the first one that gets the hook from Cindy. So I will end right there. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Glenn, let's pivot to you. From the perspective of, ge of a geographer, you've studied the effects of climate on many different ecosystems, from forests and lakes to estuaries and oceans. Can you share with us your observations on how ecosystems are and will be impacted and how that could affect human society? Can you also comment on how ecosystems can serve as climate solutions? Sure, thanks. thanks for the question and thanks for having me here. So I'm a, a boots on the ground field scientist and I'm gonna give you my perspective from, from the trenches, from the field and uh, why this initiative, the Climate Crossroads Initiative is so important. Um, I, I just wanna say this, this isn't as though climate change is affecting some sort of pristine world where everything was going well. Folks, we've lost since 1500 a, uh, CE, over 800 known animal species. We've probably lost many, many more than that. UN has, predict, has estimated that about 70% of the terrestrial land cover has been affected or altered by human activity, and that's having a huge effect on animals today. There was recently a study published by the World Wildlife Foundation, which looked at 5,200 species over 3,200 populations and found about a 69% decline, about 69% of these are declining in their population numbers. We take a look at things that I'm very familiar with, California and the Western United States in terms of fire. We saw in 2020 uh, in the state of California, 4 million acres burnt. That was a huge, huge record. We've seen throughout the Western United States a long-term secular trend since the 1980s of increasing annual area burn, increasing se fire severity. That is directly linked to increasing temperatures and increasing vapor pressure deficit, the dryness of the air. We see sea level rising. We see uh, marine heat waves affecting our nearshore uh, biota. Throughout the world, we're seeing effects of climate change on an already stressed system. So we have to take this extremely, extremely seriously. Now, I believe that ecosystems are at the nexus of this. And I'm thinking about engineering and I'm thinking about medicine. They are at the nexus of this. If we take a look at what those wildfires are doing, there was an estimate that in terms of communities, in terms of costs, in terms of economics, the 2018 wildfire season costs about, if you look at all the costs, about $180 billion. $33 billion of that were health-related costs. PM 2.5, fine particulate matter from smoke, is becoming a huge hazard. I don't have to tell anyone on the East Coast about that. I don't have to tell anyone in um, California about that, where we're seeing uh, rates of uh, pediatric emphysema, for example, being exacerbated by this. Uh, emergency room hospital uh, visits being exacerbated by this. The rising sea level is causing problems for coastal engineering. We are gonna to have to move the main line from the railroad track that goes from San Diego to Seattle inland because it is now threatened. So what's happening to our ecosystems, whether they're coastal, whether they're forests, they are at a nexus of what we see happening with climate change. If we take a look at the health of our cities, we think about polar bears and that was mentioned. We're not talking about a crisis for polar bears. We're talking about a crisis for the planet. 
and I mean urban as well as rural. If we take a look at what's happening with the drying out of California, we were doing remote sensing studies of uh, browning of the you know, natural vegetation, and we will filter out the cities. We started looking at the cities, and what we see is there is a browning going on because of the high uh, temperatures and because of water restrictions that we've had. Where is that concentrated? Communities of color, socio-demographic areas of lower income. We are seeing then inequality. And that came up this morning when we talked about, when we heard from the presidents. And that is a medical issue as well, as well as an engineering issue. How do we keep our cities cooler? Because where we're seeing that loss of urban vegetation, we're seeing increasing urban heat island. And again, how we counteract that, there's a medical implications, but there's also engineering implications. Now, can natural systems be part of the solution? They can be if we can increase the rate at which carbon is sequestered, or at least protect the rate at which carbon is being sequestered in these systems. There have been a number of studies. I was very fortunate to lead one in Canada, which had 19 scientists and looked at the potential for ecosystems to sequester carbon in Canada, Canadian ecosystems. And this was over 300 pages looking at that, that issue. I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but I'll say this. This has been studied in the United States, has been studied in Canada, has been studied worldwide. The United States, one estimate is about 21% of annual emissions could be taken out of the atmosphere by enhanced carbon sequestration from natural ecosystems, forests, better agricultural practices, rangelands, protection of grasslands, things like that. Worldwide, there's an estimate that about 30% could be sequestered. The vast majority of that though, the highest amounts would be in the tropical regions, in the global south. And again, we then get at the international aspect of this. Canada itself, despite its vast, uh, agri uh, vast agricultural and forest areas, we calculated about six to 12%. Now that may not sound big to you, 21% for the United States, six to 12% for Canada. But that is huge. That's larger than a lot of smaller countries produce in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. It would basically negate the emissions from all the stationary plants uh, in Canada if we could take advantage of that. And we can talk later about the challenges, but there is opportunities there, but I also wanna say there's huge challenges in that. Finally, if we don't do this, if we don't work at enhancing and protecting the ability of our nat natural uh, carbon sequestration systems, our ecosystems, we are facing a carbon bomb. For example, if we take a look at peatlands, global peatlands, there's somewhere about six to 700, 600 to 760 gigatons of carbon, which is stored in those systems. That's getting close to the amount that's in the atmosphere. With warming, we will see that released, perhaps as methane, perhaps directly as carbon through fires and aerobic decomposition. We're sitting on huge stocks of carbon in our nature, uh, natural systems, which we could release, and we have to battle against that. Those wildfires in Canada that are burning, about 76,000 square kilometers, released about up to now, and still counting, 160 million tons of carbon. We have to tackle this issue. Raj, I'd like to turn to you. You've been working at the intersection of climate and communities through your position as vice president of community science at the American Geophysical Union. You've been a pioneer in partnering with communities, especially historically marginalized communities. Can you tell us what it means to be an effective partner with diverse local communities and what the scientific community needs to consider in supporting climate resilient communities in the face of unprecedented climate change? Thank you for the question and thanks for the opportunity to be here. One of the things I've been thinking a lot about is how we work and the relationships we build are inseparable from the work we do. And, and so I'm gonna to try to start out with an inclusive introduction. That's something I'm working on. Um, my name's Raj, uh, my pronouns are he, him. And for people who might have difficulty seeing, I have brown skin, gray hair, I'm wearing a blue suit. And for the first time in like three years, I'm wearing a tie. Uh, 
I live, I live and work in Boulder, and that's land that was taken from the Arapaho Ute and Cheyenne people. The state called Colorado is home to 48 contemporary tribes, and I live and work in a country that has a history of enslaving people and is dealing with the ongoing harm from that practice. Um, I say that to remind myself uh, more than anything else to include in my work as a scientist and as a, as a person efforts to repair those ongoing harms and to work toward justice. So with that, I'll, I'll answer the question, I, I'll try to answer the question of what it means to be an effective partner. I've had the opportunity to observe lots of really effective partnerships between scientists, science, and local communities around community resilience. And I think there's four things that stand out uh, in the really effective partnerships. First is a notion of beginning with community priorities. Um, it's never about scientists coming in and telling communities what they should do, what's good for them. It's about asking communities what they'd like to accomplish and then being an ally in accomplishing those things in ways that are good for the community, good for the earth and good for science. Um, community priorities are always multidisciplinary in my experience. There isn't a community priority that maps to a single discipline. So we have the opportunity to work convergently in all of this. And that word priorities is really important. Um, Mayor Washington in Midway, Georgia said to me once, I am tired of rich cities having priorities and poor cities having needs. So it's an asset-based framing, which isn't to minimize the systemic inequities that certain communities face. But, um, and then finally, sometimes that working with and beginning with community priorities is a pragmatic choice. We've had communities who say to us, I wanna work on floods, I wanna work on flood resilience, it's flooding a lot, but I do not wanna talk about climate change. That is a non-starter here. And we say, okay, usually within six months, a year, they're coming back and saying, can we talk a little bit about that climate change stuff? So um, building trust creates an opportunity for that conversation. Um, second and really closely related is this idea of honoring community knowledge. It builds on that asset-based framing. Communities know what's going on about their places. They know what's happening there. And that is absolutely critical to the success of the science we wanna do as partners to those communities. Um, we did a project in the Premier Mountains of Afghanistan and Tajikistan, and it incorporated climate science into traditional ecological calendars. These are the calendars that the community had used for centuries to guide agricultural and pastoral practices. And what I loved about that project was the humility of offering science as a complement to an older way of knowing. And I think that kind of humility is at the heart of really good community science partnerships. Um, it also led to a better project. The scientists who were involved got a much richer picture of the ecology and its changes over time by being willing to take that. And then last, or third, there's four, so that's third, um, counting is hard. Um, end with community impact. We've heard so many times from, from communities that it's really challenging to work with scientists because they, they, they ask a question and they get an answer, but it's 30 pages and it's 30 days after the decision needed to be made, right? So what if we were intentional about designing not just a scientific outcome, but a community outcome and really respecting the timescales and the opportunities there. Um, sometimes in our program, we, we joke that a paper is not an outcome. Um, even if you put the community leaders' names on the paper, it's still not an outcome. Um, an outcome is, a safer neighborhood, a better future, a opportunity. We, one of the ways I learned this, we, we had this project in Denver um, and it was to collect data about um, uh, carcinogenic chemicals from dry cleaning that had leaked out of dry cleaning facilities into the groundwater and were outgassing in people's basements. And the community was very adamant about um, a bunch of places that they knew there were dry cleaning operations that hadn't made it onto the official roster of EPA investigation. So they wanted to do this, this investigation. And, and we, we had everything lined up. We were all set to go collect the data to start to understand where these chemicals were happening. And somebody said, wait, what are you gonna do if it's in my house? And we didn't have an answer. So we stopped the project, worked with the city to expand a loan program. And, and then we went out and did the measure. And for me, that really pointed out the idea of designing the science with the action already in mind and embedding that. That's what it means, I think, to design towards impact. And, and then the last point, which I think builds on stuff we've talked about and, and I hope to talk more about in a little bit, but science is a human right. 
every community deserves the opportunity to ask and answer their scientific questions and to use that science to advance their priorities, and perhaps especially communities who have historically been denied that opportunity. We did a project in New Orleans working with a local leader, Amy Stelly, who wanted to understand and act on the impact freeway the freeway was having on her community. Um, we helped her collect data on air, water, and noise pollution. She came up with the brilliant idea of having students collect that data and inviting the local media out to observe that data collection. She took that data all the way to Congress and testified about um, it, towards legislation to support highway removal. And that story to me, and that's completely the short version of the story, highlights everything I've mentioned so far, right? The idea of beginning with community priorities, the knowledge and skill that Amy and her colleagues brought to that work that made it successful, and thinking from the beginning about the outcome you want to achieve. And it, and it also really underlines this, this wonderful thing about the academies, right? Science and scientific knowledge are a kind of power. Um, they're powerful. And we, as scientists, I think we're called on to share that power. Science is a gift and, and we have an opportunity and a responsibility to share that gift. Important points for us to consider, thank you. Jonathan, I know you're there because I can see you in multiple places <laughs> on the screen here. Thank you for uh, joining us virtually. I'd like to draw on your experience and perspective from serving as a lead author I want to call it the IPCC so badly because I never say intergovernmental panel on climate change fully. Mm -hmm. um, your time spent starting up the Global he Health Initiative at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on key issues at the intersection of climate change, human health, and equity, the topic of the National Academies of Medicine Grand Challenge raised earlier in the first session. So. Um, thank you for your insights. Sure. Cindy, can you hear me okay? Is it good? Okay. Yes, Assuming... you're good. Okay. Yeah, I just want to uh, say again, under Victor Zhao's leadership, the National Academy of Medicine is really addressing climate change, very high priority for the National Academy of Medicine. And I want to say that these previous speakers have really teed up what I want to talk about. Uh, I want to start right now with what's happening and what has happened over the last few weeks um, as far as the wildfire smoke. And Glenn mentioned that uh, affecting major regions of the country, uh, especially high risk for children that have a higher uh, ventilation rate. Uh, and the PM 2.5 particles from wildfire smoke are about the most dangerous uh, compared to other emission sources. So that's happening right now across major regions. Um, I was uh, I attended the Montana trial about uh, climate change. These the young plaintiffs challenging the state of Montana uh, in the state constitution it guarantees a clean and healthy environment. And um, you know, in the test in the testimony, I've learned that, the snowpack is two to three weeks shorter than it used to be, which puts the, the highland uh, forests at very high risk. So this is something that, uh, as Glenn mentioned, is urgent and it's absolutely a, a major health challenge. Uh, of course, right now we're experiencing heat across uh, many parts of the country, parts of the world, India, devastating heat waves two years ago, the heat dome in northern North, uh, Western North America, uh, North America, uh, significant uh, mortality there. Uh, but of course, we all know that climate change is not just about heat, it's about extremes of the hydrologic cycle. Uh, we're having major floods in Europe. Pakistan was devastated last year by flooding. And if you think about these extreme weather factors of uh, heat waves and flooding, uh, there's an enormous equity challenge. Um, Glenn mentioned this uh, previously about red line, uh, previously red line zones in the urban uh, centers. Um, there are studies out of Richmond that show that the urban heat island effect is, is the hottest in the formerly red line uh, zones. Uh, obviously, uh, urban planning 
ignored um, poor communities. They didn't design parks or plant trees. Um, so you've got poor communities uh, in the urban areas that are most affected uh, by heat waves. And, and at the same time, flooding, uh, where you see pictures of flooded basements and mold and risk uh, from asthma, guess what? It's a formerly red, red line zone areas that are high, highest risk. So these climatic extremes that affect our health are especially um, problems with uh, equity when you think about where you have the most vulnerability. Um, of course, we, um, you know, there are other pathways through which climate affects our health. Um, the El Nino event of 2015, 2016, that winter, uh, had brought extremely hot temperatures across Brazil and Colombia and led to a massive uh, mosquito-borne dengue fever and Zika outbreak um, e epidemic, really. Um, and so because of the multiple exposure pathways through which climate change affects our health, um, I view this as our largest uh, environmental public health challenge of our lifetime. But at the same time, I think the Crossroads uh, initiative and the, the approach to, to climate change or the climate crisis uh, is where we have the most exciting opportunities. Um, when we think about the energy sector, the food sector and transportation sectors, um, there are enormous benefits to our health when we decarbonize. And um, I'll just, you know, give a couple of examples. Uh, in the United States, air pollution uh, from our for, from our um, energy sources uh, kills somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people every year. Even in with our Clean Air Act uh, in the United States, we we see mortality. And um, if we were, we actually conducted a study and found that if we could decarbonize across sectors, that would save. 53,000 lives every year. So, you know, decarbonizing, it may stabilize the climate, but more immediately it benefits our, our human health. Looking at the food sector, uh, a landmark uh, commission report came out of Lancet, the EAT commission report, uh, looking at the universal healthy reference diet, which is a very uh, much reduced meat diet uh, more fruits and vegetables, and the, the diets that we know, all of us in this room know, are pretty healthy. Well, that would save 11,000 lives um, every year. I'm sorry, um, 11 million lives every year. Uh, 11 million lives every year from a healthy reference diet. Uh, and it also have a less ecological footprint, for, especially from livestock, agriculture. Um, and finally, um, transportation. Um, you know, physically, the physical fitness promoted from active travel, from walking and biking, uh, which uh, already saves 4 million lives every year. And um, if we are able to design cities so that uh, active travel is promoted safely and equitably, um, that would have a tremendous benefit because uh, exercise doesn't just burn calories. Uh, contracting muscles are a chemi chemical factory for anti-cardiovascular uh, and uh, anti-carcinogen. Uh, uh, so, so this is really, uh, we all know how important exercise is, but we need, we need to design cities for people, not for private motor vehicles. That's the problem. So I'll just wrap up and uh, mention that as we move towards a low carbon society, we really need to have um, a just energy transition. There's been a legacy of, of uh, poor communities suffering from uh, siting power plants near them. And so we need to make sure that we provide, um, you know, we, we really think in this energy transition, we think about being, being fair about it. Uh, and we don't um, repeat the, uh, the the mistakes we've done in the past. Uh, so I think this is where uh, we we can think about 
decarbonizing uh, and, and stabilizing climate as something in the long term, but more immediately, uh, there are so many ways that health will benefit if we can get away from fossil fuels. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, really, really helpful points for us to consider there. This is the part where I'd like to moderate a discussion, but I'm actually gonna give free reign to our panelists getting questions to ask. Um, there's a lot of themes that ca cut across the different pathways. And as I've said, it could be thought of as a braided pathway. There aren't four distinct pathways, but intersecting pathways. What are some of the issues that you think we should prioritize or center as we launch this crossroads initiative? Um, they may be beneficial to the work in multiple pathways, or are there some pathways where we might see benefits here, but maybe uh, not so beneficial there, and we need to be mindful as we move forward? Um, how should we think about these trade-offs? So I am happy to open it up. Jerry, do you- I take a first crack. We'll let Jerry go. Okay. So if I had to choose one thing, I'd say public engagement because it is sort of the integrating factor. Of course, it gets directly with issues that Raj was raising. And if we do a good job of public engagement and really engage with people and listen and understand their priorities, every one of these other issues It's following my jacket, Amanda. I'm, I'm getting fashion advice here. Public engagement is the grand integrating function uh, because uh, it brings out priorities and it's very important that we understand those, but also must bring in all the sciences we need to understand how those priorities link to the phenomena out there that are in the end affecting those priorities. And that leads then to a context for understanding what engineering solutions are best, which are most responsive. So if I, if I had to choose one, and I'd rather not, I would choose public engagement. Others? Yeah, I actually, I very much agree with that. There, there's lots of uncertainties in the science, you know, and and how how are we going to quote engineer some of these um, natural ecosystems to be better carbon um, sinks and sequesters of carbon? However, those actions have to be taken locally, right? It's not going to be some broad, you know, international mandate. It's going to be locally. And you have to then discuss with people. It has to be sensitive culturally and economically. And I think one of the important things uh, that, that, that came to the fore in the, the report we did for Canada was that indigenous peoples live in these landscapes, both in the global south, but also across the north in Eurasia and, and North America. They, they are embedded in the landscape. This is part of their culture. And, um, going in with some kind of a mandate and not engaging, uh, it's just, you can't do it and it won't work. And so I think that that's a special category where we really need to, we really need to sort of understand what we're doing and how to do it right. But we have a lot of solutions. They come out of engineering, they come out of ecology, but they may not be acceptable to the public for one reason or the other. And I think that despite all the science uncertainty that's there, this is really, really important that we tackle that, that we have willingness and sensitivity to move forward with it. Raj, with your, your work in community science, I'm sure you have some thoughts as well. Yeah, I, I really love this notion of, of this is a collaborative process. This is, this is about engaging in a deeply collaborative and, and positive process of thinking about not only what the potential solutions are, but how they work in particular contexts. And that's what I think I'm hearing both of you saying and totally echo. I think the things I would add are, you know, when we think about where and, and how we want to work, um, maybe we can prioritize, maybe we, we should prioritize the communities that are, um, that have benefited the least from cheap energy, that have often been harmed by the extraction of fossil fuels, 
and are at the front lines of climate, climate impacts. Um, let's start there. Let's prioritize those partnerships. And, and in doing that, I think it's important that we recognize that these communities aren't just victims. They're also at the leading edge of innovation because they have to be, right? They have powerful things to teach all of us about how adaptation mitigation can work towards and contribute to a better world. Um, for example, one of the things I've, I've been learning a lot about is sort of what it means to be resilient, right? And, you know, we've always, I think people have always thought about resilience as bouncing back. More and more people are talking about not just bouncing back, but bouncing forward. Um, the thing I've really appreciated is resilience isn't just the opportunity to build better. It's the opportunity to rebuild systems that created inequity and made certain communities have to be vulnerable in the first place. And that is a really powerful notion. And then you mentioned sort of what we can learn by working with indigenous communities. What There's some really cool work about mindset, about how people conceive of themselves in relationship to the planet and the difference between an apart from nature versus a part of nature mindset. And I think the opportunity to learn more about that and understand how that can influence the ways in which we think about and conceive and make choices about our interaction with the planet and with each other could be really powerful. Clearly the listening and learning is 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 a part of that. Um, Jerry, I know you wanted to say something. I just else. want to add a footnote and, and it's kind of cheating. Sorry, Jonathan, I'm, <laughs> uh, just to, it, it's also engagement with people as consumers. Uh, thinking about this from the point of view of how we're going to actually get to net zero, if people are going to buy vehicles, we need them to buy EVs. We need people to buy heat pumps instead of using natural gas furnaces. So people as consumers, as actors in the uh, energy economy um, is also a crucial part of this. Right. Jonathan, can I ask you to weigh in as well? Sure, sure. Yeah. And I'm just going to say, uh, from my own perspective, of course, to, to keep health and equity in mind as we go forward on um, solving the climate crisis. Uh, for example, um, carbon capture and storage is talked about. And if we're just going to be capturing CO2 without uh, reducing criteria pollution, uh, or if there's more pollution that goes into running a carbon capture and storage for CO2, that's that's a non-starter. So we uh, we need to be uh, fair when we think about uh, putting a price on carbon and understand, um, you know, we don't want the backlash. Uh, we don't want the yellow vest movement that occurred. Uh, you know, we have to be really careful about how we put prices on carbon. Um, but we do need to act. We need to, we can't burn any more coal, but we need to support coal mining communities. So we really need to invest in a fair uh, energy transition. And finally, um, regarding the transition, uh, full life cycle assessment. You know, we, for those electric cars that require cobalt and lithium for the batteries, uh, what's happening with, with mining, you know, coal mining, uh, cobalt mining and uh, lithium mining. We need, really need to put health and equity uh, at the forefront of decisions uh, as we try to make these uh, solutions more broad scale. I, I just want to directly address that I, again about the costing thing. I think that that's, that's really important. I want to tackle it from two ways. One is you know, you use a um, uh, marginal abatement cost, $100 per ton, right? And and that is such a narrow focus thing. It, it's just, you know, when you actually look at the social cost of carbon, you can get up to $3,000 per ton, right? 182 is a pretty good, very conservative one. So uh, we even with, take outside the carbon credit program, which I think uh, President McNutt rightly said is really not done so much for us. The, the this hundred dollars per ton the the um, marginal abatement cost is maybe not realistic. Um, the other thing is this: when you look at nature-based carbon solutions for ecosystems, there isn't just one bottom line. It's not just a bottom line of how many tons of carbon you're going to sequester. 
doing it right, you're going to preserve biodiversity and you're going to preserve ecosystem services. And we found in terms of the budgeting and costing, you put in then the preservation of ecosystem services, all of a sudden this becomes much, much more cost effective. And it can be anything like, for instance, preserving coastal marshes so that you have green infrastructure for coastal flooding, as well as for filtering water coming off the land, right? And that's something that has to be, at least in the area I work in, which is nature-based carbon solutions, you have to look at the triple, quadruple bottom lines that you get when you start looking at biodiversity conservation, recreational opportunities, ecosystem services, and things like that. Suddenly it pencils out economically. I think it was two things that 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 I heard that like, I love this idea of consumer like choices, right? And I think, you know, I have a friend who says the first sign of gentrification is Teslas and solar panels. And that's like a horrible indictment of the ways in which we've chosen to decarbonize, right? Tax credits are great, but they don't do you any good if you don't have the money up front, right? And then, and then this notion of, of minerals, like historically extraction of resources has gone hand in hand, maybe even been enabled by um, exploitation of people. And, and we need to make a choice not to do that as we move into this new energy economy. And, and I, maybe the last thing I would say is that um, inequity isn't sustainable. Like it's just inherently unstable and all of that extra money that you have to invest in keeping people down could be invested in bringing people up if we make a choice to go there equitably. Very good points. Um, Jonathan, I'm assuming I can move on to the next question, but okay, signal if you wanna interject at some point and I will, I will certainly welcome your thoughts. Um, I'm going to queue up a second question, and then I'm also going to tell you, the audience, that you'll get a chance in just a few minutes to ask questions as well. Around um, 1140, we'll start taking questions from the audience, virtual and in person. So just be thinking of your question, and then we'll have you go to the microphones in a few moments. So the next question I have for the panel is... Um, We'd like to probe a bit deeper on the challenges and opportunities in moving from science to action. I mean, we've talked a little bit about how do we prioritize, who can we help or not hurt as we do that, but can you offer thoughts about um, critical opportunities, critical barriers? Um, we've talked about Teslas and solar panels being uh, barriers to a, a large fraction of, of people. And as we think about equity and moving forward, what are some other ways that we should be considering how we do move forward? That's such a hard question that I'm hoping they'll answer it. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, so I'm gonna just speak in the area of nature-based carbon solutions, right? Um, that the, the cheapest, easiest thing to do is basically conserve the carbon sequestrant sources we have. And, and, you know, we've seen, for instance, a number of countries under the aegis of the UN have signed a declaration to halt deforestation, right? That is like not doing anything uh, can be the most cost-effective thing you can do. Conserve the lands that you presently have. That, that is, I think, right now, uh, the most important thing we can do, preserve our wetlands. They are really important carbon sequestration um, mechanisms, preserve our forested lands. And then after that, it's management. And typically your big, biggest bang for the buck is forest management. And that's from the tropics all the way up to the boreal forest. Um, you know, uh, and that doesn't mean that you're not ever taking any resources out, but if you are going to log that area, that wood will go into something that is gonna last for a long time. You know, that the biochar that's produced, for instance, is going to go into agricultural fields and is going to help then with carbon balance there. And so uh, how we manage our resources, particularly forests and agricultural resources are the second area. But right now, just don't wreck what we already have or the few things we have left. I, I will attempt to add to that. Um, Let's think about how we in this country have so far approached this problem. By this problem, I mean thinking of it as a systems analyst engineer. How do we get to net zero in 2050? 
And largely what we've been doing is providing incentives, tax credits, subsidies, and disincentives like taxes uh, and charges. We really have not, and so far have not, mandated action, which is a hard thing for us to do in this country. So the, the question becomes, how can we, if that, one question is, can we get there with only tax credits and subsidies and, and taxes? Uh, another is, how can we craft that so that we get desirable outcomes in other respects, like, is it fair? Is it just? Is it creating resilient communities? Um, is it producing the kinds of ecosystem impacts that we want? Uh, I, that's the point I was making in my opening remarks about having, uh, there's not a finite number of pathways to get from here to there. The key is to choose which one. But choosing a pathway then to achieve it requires you to put in policy instruments. And that's a whole other level of, uh, of complexity. So to sort of the bottom line of that is we need to be adaptive. We need to allow ourselves to be adaptive. That is, we've tried something. We've had three laws passed in the last two years that are having real impact. And we have to do a very good job of monitoring, uh, excuse me, what those impacts are and then adjust accordingly. We have the sort of political will and the science um, in order to adapt and therefore get to a pathway, stay on a pathway that'll get us to 2050 uh, at net zero and on a path that we find desirable. I'd also like to maybe ask a question at this point, as we've talked about it. Are there top-down or bottom-up solutions that work better? Is it what, what approach has been shown to work in the past? Um, and, and when we say bottom-up, is that local community? Is that local county? Is that state? Um, are there examples of things that have worked or not worked? And Jonathan, feel free to jump in at any point too. I'm not ignoring you. Sure. Well, I'll I'll jump in right now and say, um, I I think that um, it's it's a good idea to start locally, and it may be that um, that mayors uh, and local initiatives are what leads, uh, and and the national and international will follow. I think that's more uh more generally what happens um i think the inflation reduction act is is uh, is wonderful that it happened uh, i hope it gets implemented that's the big challenge now but um not to get frustrated at national levels uh depending on administrations and to really uh be looking locally uh where you can get innovation and and relevance that can expand out um I also think that uh, it's important, sort of bridging both of your questions, uh, to include the positive opportunities in the messaging. Uh, and the doom and gloom doesn't go very far and it leads to paralysis. So it, it include the, the real uh, positive opportunities and include that into the messaging and, and pick the right messengers. Uh, there's uh, climate change communication science that shows that Nurses and doctors are the most trusted messengers, even on climate science. Uh, so, uh, you know, engage the right messengers, include the positive message, um, start locally and uh, build on movements. Uh, the youth movement is very impressive. And uh, so putting science into movement building, uh, I think these are some, some uh, ways to get science to action. I just add, um, so here's a, a, a really valuable role for the academies, I think. I do believe, as Jonathan said, that um, local innovation uh, is really gonna be important. Uh, Glenn said before, all of this happens locally. I mean, it happens on the face of the earth somewhere or everywhere. And so it's happening locally. The convening role of the 
um, of the academies can be really powerful in that respect. So we're learning about best practices and, and also disseminating them. And in that regard, so when Victor made his point about, and you know, Jonathan's point about people trusting doctors and nurses, now they're gonna ask you what's your date of birth, what's your health insurance, and what's your carbon footprint? <laughs> I guess we'll cue that up then for our next doctor visit. <laughs> um, at this point, I'd like to somewhat open it up to questions from the audience, both the in-person audience, and then I don't know if Alex or somebody else will be helping us with questions from people online. What I'd like to ask for is if you just briefly state your name and then your question. Um, it looks like there's a thunderous turnout. So if it's okay, I'll start on the right because that's who I saw first. Go ahead, thank you. Thank you. My name is Karen Florini, I'm with Climate Central. In 2016, the Academy issued a seminal report showing that you can in fact use attribution science to connect the dots and quantify the relationship between extreme weather events and climate change. Climate Central has built on that uh, in order to create a method and a tool that now allows us to quantify the fingerprint of climate change everywhere in the world every day. My question is for Dr. Patz. How can this tool be used most effectively in communicating linkages between climate and health? And my question also for Dr. Uh, Cohen. Similarly, how can that tool be used to build public support for rapid decarbonization? Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll briefly uh, answer your question, which is that yes, the Climate Attribution Initiative has been uh, really important in our communication because uh, for so long people would say, yeah, that heat wave from climate change, you can only talk about probabilities, but now with the statistical analysis and that that initiative, the Climate Attribution Initiative, you know, they were able to say the, the heat wave in the Northwest that that killed hundreds of people um, you know, it was virtually impossible without human-induced uh, climate change, you know, the one degree average temperature warming in, in the world. So I think as far as communicating in health and risk, it's important to be able to say, yes, you know, we can now say uh, climate change had a contribution here, and therefore don't just focus on the emergency of today, but actually go upstream and and turn off the faucet that's causing the problem not not just keep mopping up the floor so i think that attribution is really useful for our communicating um the causality of these issues yeah and i have to admit that in our work we're guilty of focusing on percent reduction in uh, emissions which is sort of meaningless to people i mean it's a in really important yardstick for us, but translating that into actual outcomes that affect people, we've not really paid attention to that. And uh, frankly, I wouldn't know how to do it. Um, the climate shift index to show what the contribution of climate change to air temperature everywhere in the world every day on a real time basis now is. Right, but I, I'm trying to link that back to percent reduction in, in emissions, which is, really hard to do because you know the, the long lived uh, nature of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, but it's a really good point. And I hope our communications experts are gonna take it on. And I think I'd like to acknowledge that the Academy has um, years ago started looking at attribution and convening uh, studies to, to further that and, and bring together the community that is studying that. So in the spirit of fairness, I now will pivot to this side and ask this person to give their name and ask the question. Hi, I'm Mike McCracken. I'm a climate change scientist for the Climate Institute. Um, to me, the title decarbonization just doesn't sound like the proactive kind of response that is needed. We, we don't need to just take the carbon out. We have to build a new system and that's gonna take some some leaps and it's gonna be a tremendous potential opportunity. And I guess I'm wondering if the Academy is gonna sort of push for talking about the leaps that have to be taken. To electrify, electrify the country, just adding little additions 
of more transmission lines is not going to accomplish what needs to get done to electrify the country. I mean, the jump that's needed is to go to, in my view, a high voltage direct current buried underground system across the country, which would allow great movement. For transportation, we're going to have to come up with a replacement. It, partly it may be electric, partly it may be hydrogen. I would think the academy would be talking about where we have to go rather than sort of reacting in terms of taking carbon out as the, the main path forward. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I did an injustice to this effort. It is exactly what you just described. It's not in any way just saying, how do we take the carbon out constrained by the current system? It's very much anticipating and looking at the kinds of new systems that we need with a focus on what kinds of policy instruments need to be designed in order to get us there. So it does have that uh, major change in system nature uh, aspect to it. So Amanda, I would say much more proactive as well as you start to set up all of your goals. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, question over here. I'm Wes G. I'm a second year master's student from Columbia University. And my question is how, it's a community engagement question, how do you talk to communities that aren't interested in green policies, not for some ideological reason, but because they historically haven't been able to economically benefit from pollution or environmentally uh, degraded uh, research practices? And the reason I bring it up is because the program that I'm a part of is that we try to get some national students. And one thing that comes up constantly is who, who is for the, the West or the global North to come into the global South and, and tell them to greenify their economies when, they, when the global South wasn't the one that caused the problem initially. Um, so I guess um, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about you know, communities that kind of come to you and are, you know, interested in green policies, but want to know how they can sort of uh, make up for what they haven't been able to gain in the past by being able to pollute. I, well, first of all, thanks for the, the question and thanks for foregrounding this sort of historical inequity that that is the context of a lot of this work, right? And I think part of the answer is doing that. Part of the answer is having that honest conversation about where we are and how we got here and how we want the future to be different. I think in that context, often with individual communities, we find sort of it becomes a conversation about where do you want to start? Like what everything you just said is true and how do we want to tackle it how do you want to tackle it and how can we be your ally in helping you tackle it um, often that means sometimes it doesn't start where you think it's going to start um, and and that's okay and and another thing that I think sometimes happens that's really positive and and encouraging is you you get these sort of multiple goods at once um, the example of the, the green, green spaces in urban places is a great example of that. We worked with a, um, someone in, in New Orleans who wanted to plant trees um, as a way of managing the landscape, as a way of reducing heat, as a way of creating places where people could congregate and be safe outside, as a way of building social networks, because we know that one of the best, um, one of the best defenses against extreme heat is strong social networks. Um, it's not the only, um, you need an infrastructure, but, and, and so those kinds of things that allow you to tackle all of those things. And then, you know, while you're in that park, maybe have a rally about climate justice. Um, those are the, I, I don't know that that's a great answer, but I'm really excited that you're asking the question. And I think that's, the, and maybe that's where I would pivot to what the academies can do is the academies can start to create the venues to ask these questions. The academies can start to lean into the ways in which our systems of tenure and promotion and, and funding scientific research um, enable certain kinds of questions to be asked and not others. 
Um, they can uh, reduce the so-called diversity tax, right? The fact that everybody has to do diversity on the side and nobody gets to count it in their tenure application. The academies have a huge standing within the world of the scientific community. And by being a model, by being an example, by elevating things that work, the academies can start to move that system towards the ways in which it can be a good ally for the community-based work that you're talking about. That was a long answer, I'm sorry. Thanks for the question. That was really useful. Um, can I ask you to ask your question, please? Hi, uh, my name is Mariah Merritt. I do public health ethics at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my question is about the urgency of the actions that we need and how we can engage the public on the near-term co-benefits of climate action, right? So uh, communication science tells us that the fossil fuel industry's talking point these days is, well, we get that the transition needs to happen, but we have that under control. It's going to take a while. Let's just extract some more profits, right? And, and the health sector can say, we can't wait. We have health impacts that will will uh, benefit people immediately as soon as we, we stop combusting fossil fuels and, and it will save costs. So the health sector, I think, has that conversation uh, underway. And I'm curious about other systemic obstacles and other um, ways to make near-term benefits of climate action explicit to counter these delaying tactics. Question, well, Jonathan, I, did, did you want to? Yeah, I'll jump in and just say, number one, I would start with the 2018 um, IPCC report, the uh, the 1.5 degrees report that says, hey, we have to cut emissions 45% by 2030 uh, to avoid catastrophic uh, system-wide disasters. Um, so number one, as I, I would go ahead and talk about the risks and the assessment is, this is an emergency, you know, timing wise, we have to really, we have to cut emissions in half almost by tomorrow, you know, 2030. And I would harp on that, you know, that's a, that's a scientific assessment. Um, and at the same time, of course, uh, you know, just talk about both those risks that will spin out of control unless there's immediate action, as well as harp on the immediate benefits, even for climate deniers, to say, are you kidding? You know, look at all the hundreds of thousands of lives uh, that are, uh, you know, th that we lose because of our current habit. And uh, so I think you need, you should put forward both the urgency and the scientific assessment that we need to cut emissions tomorrow, as well as the golden opportunity, even if people don't focus on climate. Uh, that's that's my how I would approach it. Both both two pronged approach. And I do think that we learned during COVID that we are actually faster to pivot than we ever gave ourselves credit for. If we think that there's a real reason to pivot, so the human species is maybe not quite as stuck in the mud as we've given ourselves the uh, leisure to accept in the past. Um, I'm looking to the Amandas for a little bit of direction. I can continue to take questions from the audience. Um, I want to give the panelists a heads up. I'm going to ask you for your elevator 20 second pitch at the end of what's the one thing you'd like us to take away from here. I see that we have roughly five minutes left. Um, okay, Alex, take it away from our online friends. Right, thank you. And some of these are, I think, from folks in the audience, but submitted online. I'm gonna ask two that are linked in the, under the header of kind of what can the academies do? So Robin Shane asks possibly for Glenn specifically, you know, dollars as a metric for goods and services seem insufficient to represent the whole value of natural ecosystems for the functioning of human society. And Jonathan Katz spoke about this in the context of human health as well. Uh, can the academies find a way to go beyond monetary estimates to express that value that would lead society to protect ecosystems more than we do now? And I'm going to ask a second question from David Kay for anyone to answer. I appreciate new ideas about what the braided pathways should consist of, but isn't the real need about how to do what is needed? Are we putting enough scientific resources into understanding the question of the how? What is the role of expertise here? So that's a question about 
change science and decision science and how we actually do the things we say we need to do. I think the first question was about, can we go beyond monetary uh, values for assessing impact, um, both in natural systems and other systems? Glenn, I don't know if you have a... Yeah, so I, I'm sorry, but you know, I, I, I couldn't hear very well the question, so I'm really sorry about that. Um, I think one of the really key things is monitoring any of these interventions and um, and this is this gets to that, that top down bottom up the monitoring is going to part of it can be done with remote sensing and things like that, but part of it has to be local monitoring both in terms of the uh, success of your carbon sequestration, but also uh, what are the other benefits that you're getting what's happening to your biodiversity what's happening to your ecosystem services. Are there some unintended consequences that are occurring? And I think that the devil is going to be in the details of that in terms of assessing the success of some of these things. And we've seen other programs where, for instance, if a developer wants to develop someplace, but it's going to drain a wetland, they say, well, we'll create another wetland someplace else. As soon as that's done, then they step back and that wetland fails, right? That, that happens time and time again. And so uh, that monitoring that is going to be tricky business, and that assessment is really, really important, but has to be ongoing, and there's probably going to be some adaptive management that comes into it. And I'll just give you one quick example. We, we worked on a project to um, add sediment to a marsh, which was essentially subsiding and disappearing in coastal California. And we found out that you know the cost and what actually happened five years the marsh was not regenerating at all. And that would have been lethal to let's say endangered populations of something like building sparrow or something there. And, but we had to continuously keep going back and monitoring and now we're beginning to see it uh, coming back and we're understanding where the mistakes were made and what the degree of natural resilience was. But imagine that multiplied millions of times, okay? This is a really, really big deal. And yes, you know, monetary think, value is not adequate. You're right. Benefit cost analysis is not the right approach in these contexts. Um, if I could just quickly add, um, within the National Academy of, of Medicine, there's a, a roadmap to systematic change pro, uh, part of it. And uh, in just as far as moving forward, uh, we had a, a meeting recently where we're talking about what se what sectors should be included uh, versus how system change occurs. And the decision was that the how, looking at uh, decision-making, mapping of key actors, uh, thought that the how may be more important than the what, you know, what which sectors. So I think that question, you know, like how, how do these, how does system-wide change happen? is worth studying and something that uh, National Academy of Medicine is going to be prioritizing in its approach to this roadmap for systematic change. I'm gonna do one more question to the person, I think it's orange. You're, the lights are so bright up here that we can only see blobs out there, but please go ahead. Hi, Sandra Bear with Personal Cities. I, I love this conversation about the communications, the message, the messengers. Uh, I, I work with cities all over the world and I find their resistance is based on a lack of trust, but it's also based on just um, having champions to really uh, advocate for quick action and big action, bolder decisions. So uh, what Dr. Pat said about, uh, you know, making sure you know who the messenger is and, and making sure the communication is positive as well as you know the risks involved. Uh, what I'm curious about is I wonder if you could, could sort of say, here's the first step you should take in dealing with a city or a community, no matter what its size, about getting city leaders to understand this is something we have to act on now. It has to be the top priority. Well, maybe after AI. But anyway, the, the next question is, who are the champions? Who owns this? Is it the academicians? Uh, some of you are so smart and knowledgeable and engaged with the world, but are, are you really communicating out to everyday people about what needs to be done? The how, is, as Dr. Pest just said, is, is, in my opinion, the most critical. Thank you. And I would add, I think one of the things that we heard in earlier sessions was that it's going to be a different communications that we do 
than we did when Abraham Lincoln was president. So we will be moving forward a little bit there. Um, at this point, before I forget, I just want to thank the panelists because this has been a really interesting conversation. There's been prep that you haven't seen on their parts. And so I really appreciate all the time and thought that they've given to this panel. And unless my bosses tell me otherwise, 20 seconds, each one of you, what your one take home could be if you were to inscribe in my brain. Uh, if you're old enough to remember Burma shave signs, road signs in a sequence that convey a message with thanks to John Holmes, the director of the uh, Board on Energy and Environmental Systems, uh, electrify the end uses, decarbonize the power sector, maximize the efficiency of every sector. That's to get us to the 2030 uh, goal. Of course, there will be a lot more research and everything else, but remember those three things for the next seven years. Thanks, Jerry. Glenn? Okay, so, uh, you know, healthy, resilient ecosystems are at the nexus of the climate change challenges we face. And they, they transcend medicine, engineering, healthy cities, right across the board. They're part of the solutions, but only part of the solutions. Maybe six to 20%, maybe. And so we're gonna have to use them as a portfolio that goes beyond that. And that it's part of a whole package of things that we have to do, but they should not be undersold. And the great benefit is that if we do it right, we will get ecosystem services, we'll protect biodiversity, we'll have a better planet in general, but they're only part of the solution. Thanks, Glenn. Raj? I, I, I would build on that. Um, I, I think if I had to say one thing, it would be listen. Learn to listen really, really well, um, because the thing we have to offer has a fit, but we need to listen to understand that fit. Jonathan, we look to you for words of wisdom. Sure. I, I'll just say that the, the climate crisis is a human health emergency and that climate action offers the greatest health opportunities of our lifetimes as we uh, divert, divert away from fossil fuel burning. So golden opportunity. Thank you. Um, I guess at this point, I'd just like to thank the panelists again. I'd like to thank the Academy staff. It's been wonderful to work with them and they've done a lot of work to make this look seamless um, and we really appreciate everything they've done. Uh, you, I think, get to have a break and lunch out there, but we will return at 1 p.m. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>